make a car move. You burn gasoline in the engine, of course. The energy from burning gasoline physically moves parts of the engine, which send power through the transmission to the wheels. The mitochondria within cells are essentially tiny engines that burn glucose to power all of the processes that cells need to survive. In fact, mitochondria and the process of aerobic respiration that they employ are much more efficient than a combustion engine. Through the process of glycolysis, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, the energy stored in the bonds of glucose are efficiently transferred to the bonds of ATP molecules. If these processes fail due to a lack of oxygen, the cell can still survive by using the process of fermentation. Since these things will certainly be on the AP test, you'd better understand them. So stick with us as we cover everything you need to know about cellular respiration. In this video, we'll be covering section 3.6 of the AP Biology curriculum. We'll start with an overview of the entire process of cellular respiration. Then, we'll take a closer look at glycolysis, the first step in cell respiration. After the first quiz, we'll examine the Krebs cycle and how it fills electron carrier molecules using the products of glycolysis. Finally, we'll see how these electron carriers power the electron transport chain in the mitochondrial inner membrane to produce enough ATP for the entire cell. If you only need to review one of these sections, feel free to skip forward to the times outlined here. Otherwise, let's get started. Cellular respiration is a metabolic process within cells that extracts energy from biological macromolecules in order to produce ATP. This ATP can then be used to power important reactions throughout the cell that help the cell maintain homeostasis, grow, and reproduce. There are two basic types of cellular respiration, anaerobic respiration and aerobic respiration. Both of these forms of cellular respiration start with the breakdown of glucose, a process known as glycolysis. Glycolysis itself releases a small amount of ATP. Then, the process of cellular respiration continues on one of two paths. If there is oxygen present, cells will carry out the process of aerobic respiration. This process sends pyruvate through the Krebs cycle, which powers the electron transport chain to produce lots and lots of ATP. If there is no oxygen, cells carry out anaerobic respiration through the process of fermentation. Fermentation does not produce any ATP itself, though it does recycle some of the electron carrier molecules used in glycolysis. The process of glycolysis adds electrons and hydrogen atoms to these molecules, and fermentation uses these molecules to create molecules like ethanol or lactic acid. This allows the electron carrier molecules to return to the process of glycolysis, ensuring that the cell can still produce a small amount of ATP. Humans, other animals, and plants almost exclusively use aerobic respiration. When we start to run out of oxygen, like when we are exercising or holding our breath underwater, our cells will use lactic acid fermentation to survive. But this process can only sustain our cells for a short amount of time. Organisms like yeast can, can conduct alcohol fermentation and can survive for a long time while they do so. In fact, this is how alcoholic beverages are produced. Think about this. While the complexities of cellular respiration we're about to dive into may seem like a drag, they couldn't be more important. Cells all over your body are constantly using cellular respiration to produce ATP to power the various things they do. The neurons in your brain are making ATP to power ion pumps that allow them to send signals. Your muscle cells are continually producing ATP to power the proteins that allow muscles to contract. Even organs you wouldn't think about, like your kidneys, are producing a steady supply of ATP to carry out all of the reactions they need in order to keep your body in homeostasis. As we start to go over the complex biochemistry that makes cellular respiration possible, keep in mind that you don't have to memorize the names of specific enzymes or know all of the reactants involved. What the AP test will be testing you on is if you understand how energy is flowing through this process. 
With that in mind, let's take a look at the first process in cellular respiration, glycolysis. Glycolysis starts with an energy investment phase. During this phase, two ATP molecules are used to break glucose down from one six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. You may recognize this G3P molecule since it is also produced as a precursor to glucose via the Calvin cycle as part of photosynthesis. You can check out our section 3.5 video to brush up on photosynthesis. After this energy investment phase, the payoff or energy harvesting phase takes place. During this phase, G3P is converted into pyruvate in a process that produces 4 ATP. You should also notice that the start of this payoff stage fills two NAD plus electron carriers with electrons, creating two NADH molecules. Therefore, the total process of glycolysis produces two pyruvate molecules, two net ATP, and two filled electron carriers. What happens to these molecules depends on whether or not the cell has access to oxygen. If there is no oxygen, these molecules enter the process of fermentation. Fermentation adds the electrons and hydrogen atoms from the NADH to the pyruvate molecules. This doesn't create any more ATP, and it can leave the cell full of toxic lactic acid or ethanol if it carries on for too long. But the process does recycle electron carriers, so the process of glycolysis can go through another cycle. This allows the cell to produce just enough ATP to survive. However, if there is oxygen, then the products of glycolysis enter the process of aerobic respiration. Though we will look further into these processes in a second, the general overview is relatively simple. Pyruvate molecules leave the cytoplasm and enter the mitochondria of a cell. This cycle creates a small amount of ATP and produces many more filled electron carriers. These electron carriers, plus the ones created during glycolysis, then enter the electron tra transport chain to power the process of oxidative phosphorylation. This process produces far more ATP than any of the previous processes, allowing cells to extract the maximum amount of energy from a single molecule of glucose. Now that we've seen an overview of cellular respiration and have discovered how glycolysis works, let's see if you picked up on the important points. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You can find all of the answers through the quick test prep link in this video's description. If there is oxygen present in a cell, the products of glycolysis will begin the process of aerobic respiration. This process starts with the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle produces carbon dioxide as it breaks pyruvate molecules down into smaller and smaller pieces. It also produces a small amount of ATP. But most of the energy extracted in the Krebs cycle is deposited into the electron carriers, including NADH and FADH2. Let's take a quick look at the complex cycle that allows this massive transformation of energy. The Krebs cycle is very complex, and for the purposes of AP Biology exam, you only need to understand a few key pieces. First, at a molecular level, the cycle is a series of reactions catalyzed by specific enzymes. While some of these reactions are reversible, others can only proceed in one direction. You'll notice that the first molecule created in the cycle is citrate or citric acid. This is why the Krebs cycle is also known as the citric acid cycle. Much like the Calvin cycle that takes place during photosynthesis, the Krebs cycle is essentially a cycle that combines carbons in energy efficient ways. However, the goal in this cycle is to extract energy from these carbon chains instead of store energy. We can see this energy come out of the cycle at several points. Some of the energy exits the cycle as new ATP molecules. However, the large majority of the energy extracted in the Krebs cycle is placed into electron carrier molecules like FADH2 and NADH. These molecules carry the energy to the electron transport chain, 
which we'll see next. One final note on the Krebs cycle that students often misunderstand is that the Krebs cycle can actually process more than just glucose molecules. In fact, we typically just focus on glucose because it is the most common molecule that your body uses for energy. But your body can also break down proteins and fat molecules into the carbon chains that they are made of. The Krebs cycle can use these molecules to power the electron transport chain, ensuring that you stay alive even when there is no glucose available. If you're starting to feel like a fish out of water, now's a good time to take a break. Stretch your legs, grab some water, and take some breaths. This stuff is complex, so take it one step at a time. When we come back, we'll dive into the final process of aerobic respiration, the electron transport chain. Okay, just to recap, we're looking at the overall process of aerobic respiration which is one of two types of cellular respiration. We've seen how glucose is broken down into pyruvate through the process of glycolysis. Then, when this pyruvate molecule can enter the mitochondrial matrix, it enters the Krebs cycle. Throughout this whole process, many electron carrier molecules are filled with electrons and hydrogen atoms. These electron carrier molecules make their way to the electron transport chain located on the inner mitochondrial membrane. The electron transport chain starts as the electron carriers created in the Krebs cycle are separated from the hydrogen atoms and electrons that they carry. These electrons then flow through a series of integral membrane proteins on the inner mitochondrial membrane. These proteins use the energy from passing electrons to pump hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. These hydrogen ions become concentrated in the intermembrane space, and ATP synthase can use this hydrogen ion gradient to add phosphate groups to ADP molecules to create ATP. Adding these phosphate groups is known as phosphorylation. The entire process carried out by the electron transport chain in mitochondria is known as oxidative phosphorylation because oxygen is the final electron acceptor at the end of the chain. We can compare this process to the process of photophosphorylation seen in the thylakoid membrane of chloroplasts. This electron transport chain is essentially the same in that it uses the energy from electrons to create a hydrogen iodine gradient that powers ATP synthase. However, this chain uses NADPH as a final electron acceptor instead of oxygen. So, electron transport chains power both the storage of energy via photophosphorylation in photosynthesis and the release of that energy via oxidative phosphorylation in aerobic respiration. And that's it! Now we've covered the entire process of cellular respiration. Now that we've covered the complexities of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, let's see if you can answer some AP style questions. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You can find all of the answers through the quick test prep link in this video's description, as well as links to all of the other resources we have created for this section. Thanks for watching. Please like this video if you found it helpful and informative. Feel free to leave us any comments or questions that you still have about the process of cellular respiration. Be sure to subscribe to the Biology Dictionary YouTube channel for quick access to all of our AP Biology videos and resources. Good luck!